So our next speaker is Andrew Short. And Andrew is a graduate from IADT. And he's a he's the virtual reality learning design manager at Amazon. So with Amazon Web Services. And he's been a consultant and instructional, instructional designer. And he's led learning and development projects in companies like Microsoft and Google. And um, very excited to have Andrew on with us today. So I'll just, um, hi, Andrew. Hey, Rob. How are you? you? I'll, I'll, I'll buzz off now and I'll give you the screen. Sure. Thanks for coming. Okay. Just share my screen. Okay. And hopefully everyone can see this. There we go. So, um, yeah, I'm here to talk about virtual reality learning, uh, specifically for practical vocational training. Um, originally, like for years when I was a consultant for multiple different projects uh, with an e-learning consultancy, my focus was figuring out like mostly novel approaches to our customers' problems, mostly because the standard approaches are often like well done with and, and uh, at times could be could become tedious to me. Uh, so I felt I always felt that delighting the learner was very important. Like there's a lot of training out there. There's a lot of negative connotations around e-learning and how laborious it can be because there's a lot of requirement for, say, safety trainings or security related compliance trainings to get content in front of people get them to sign off that they've seen it and then the company is covered but when you want to teach somebody how to thrive in their position you've got so many new people starting jobs at any day of the week um and they're kind of feeling their way around and like as a learning design like as a learning experience designer for these people you have a captive audience and you kind of have an obligation to do better um, so originally when I was looking for applications for augmented and virtual reality in training space, I um, was looking to uh, I was looking to figure out a use case. Most of our customers though um, were using compute like software. There was like lots of that. There was very little there was very little touch on the hardware itself, the practical aspects. Most of the clients were in tech. And I remember thinking how much of a good use case, the spatial aspect of VR would be for technicians and engineers working directly hands-on hardware. So uh, when I joined Amazon Web Services as a learning experience designer for a security curriculum back in 2019, soon after I joined, there was an ask from the director, like, can somebody find an application for VR? And then I put my hand up. Uh, my undergraduate degree from IADT was a special effects for film with a focus on CGI. So I just put my hand up and I said, I can make 3D models. Also, I've put some thought into how this can be used to fix servers. And I got put on all the calls and then here I am. So over the course of 2020, I was making prototypes and writing use and writing papers, trying to win budget. And eventually it got approved. So um, I'm going to run through here. Let me just no. So what we'll cover today is just an overview of AWS and their data centers, what it's all about. Um, and then the, the why, the what, and the how of VR. So why VR for training with a specific focus on how you convince a business to invest in it. Um, so like the immersive aspect, the delight that people can feel, the novel aspect of everything, the spatial context, like all of that is is kind of a given for anybody that tries VR, but how do you convince a boardroom to finance it? Um, spatial learning technolo technologies in general, like what type of spatial learning technologies are out there? I'm specifically using the term spatial here rather than immersive, because I'm also going to be briefly discussing the flat pane of glass that is desktop 3D. And then the VR training solution that I built for, uh, for training. So a uh, brief piece about AWS and Amazon in general, there's a lot of employees to train. So Amazon in general has 1.5 million employees. Uh, AWS itself has less than 10% of that total at 135,000. Um, but when it comes to the, their piece of the pie revenue wise, like as of, I believe last year, AWS has accounted for more than half of the earnings for Amazon in total. Uh, that's because they own, like AWS accounts for about one third of the cloud market. So they're the largest cloud provider um, in the world. 
and they have they started with hosting the servers for amazon.com selling books way back when when it was a server in a garage and now they host multitudinous different um services um netflix twitch prime um i actually looked it up while this lecture has been going on and um, hop in which is this solution um has aws as a as a cloud provider so this is using some of aws's streaming technology to provide the lecture so all of that is built in it started in a garage but now it's all built in massive data center warehouses and um, these are distributed all over the globe uh, a huge hub in eastern us there's actually a significant amount of, of data centers in ireland um, and it's all about the compute level it's all about the the uh, server level here so the data halls in any given data center can have around 3000 racks in them with dozens of hosts each there's hundreds of thousands of servers there's new data centers coming online every week and for every server for every server that is currently in commission it won't be five years from now they put a five-year shelf life on every single host in the fleet that means that year on year of these hundreds of thousands of of servers hundreds of thousands need to be decommissioned and recommissioned. Um, you can think of it as a figurative massive conveyor belt with hardware falling off the end all the time. And uh, it requires an army of technicians to install, maintain, and decommission this fleet. So um, the, we were tasked with finding novel ways to train these people. So the ask was to find an application for VR. As data center learning as a training team, we don't scale infinitely, but the user base does. So we got to figure out novel ways to solve the training problems, which is that there's so many people that need to learn practical tasks, and how do you how do you serve them properly? Uh, virtual reality um, is an odd was an odd kind of birth of a project because a lot with UX you identify a problem and figure out a solution for it. For this, leadership was fully aware of the value of the solution. They're like, now find the problem that it solves in this particular context and tell it to us. So um, this is our first gambit of it. Um, we made prototypes and one budget to do the first flight for virtual reality training 1.0. And what we did was we covered a whole tranche of learning topics that we're teaching engineers some of the most basic tasks that they can have so basic ticket resolves would involve like a host that has an identified broken part say a ram stick or a cpu or a motherboard they've got to open the ticket claim the parts replace the pieces and then put everything like dispose of everything that needs to be disposed of and put everything back so we did everything from soup to nuts we claimed the ticket we put on the security the safety gear we did all the security procedures getting into and out of the the data hall and we performed the repair it was a gargantuan undertaking it was quite a monolithic course and uh it was it was a success insofar as we taught people how to do the job but there were significant usability challenges like development challenges implementation challenges like with anything else a leadership um, principle in amazon is invent and simplify so this this accounts for the invent step and then the simplify step is okay now let's figure out how to do it faster cheaper get the product out in front of people without so much of a delay so i'm going to talk briefly about um the workplace blended learning approach that preceded the introduction of ER. So the goal when I joined was they were eliminating classroom PowerPoint trainings. They felt the classroom PowerPoint trainings weren't very engaging, didn't really serve the learner well enough. So what, what they were going to focus on is an online and instructor-led blended approach, which starts with online training. You take your e-learning, you learn the basic facts of each aspect of your role, and you take an online assessment. And once you've done that online assessment, you are cleared for on-the-job training. You're cleared to go in, somebody will show you around, somebody will show you each of the tasks that you must perform. And then at a later date, they'll watch you do the tasks and sign off that you're competent. It sounds good in theory, but in practice, what we found was that when we, when we ceased to support uh, PowerPoint classroom trainings, people started doing them on their own. So 
in theory, it seems like it should be a weighted approach. There's like a blended learning like curriculum in four parts um, and it should be equally weighted four ways. Um, there's knowledge and there's practice. But realistically, what happened was about 10% of the, the time was spent in the online portion, about 80% on the on the job training piece. And then 5% like, you know, 10 to 5% on the, the practical assessment. Realistically, it was essentially they get through their online trainings and then they go into the field and they're in there for a long time until the person in the field thinks that they're competent and then they'll just take whatever it takes to get the person on the job. Um, because the priority here is to get people and to get people working, get people productive. So when I was anal analyzing the problem for this one, figuring out a good solution for VR, I identified that there was like a huge amount of variability and a huge amount of learning, like learning value, like the density of learning outcomes when people were in the field were ginormous. They were able to be shown by the tutor kind of the ramifications of what they do. They're touring the data halls, they were they were inspecting the hardware, they were putting it in, putting it out. There's just so much that happens in the field with all these practical technicians. They were getting very little, they were getting very little traction out of the e-learning alone and they were kind of waiting to go on shift. So we needed to figure out a way to bottle this um, in order to drive down the the onboarding times and relieve the pressure on the people in the field. Because the people in the field would need to take time out of their day to train the new hire. And then the new hires didn't really want to be taking up their time. So it had ended up dragging on for quite some time. So I identified a missing piece. Um, you have your theory and practice here and self-service and facilitated. So your self-service theory is your web-based training, your e-learning modules, where you kind of get the the lay of the land in, in the in the short form early. You have the facilitated theory, which is your classroom piece, and then your facilitated um, practice, which is on the job training. But when it comes to practice, there was no self-service option for it. There was no way to practice the job without somebody being there, because realistically, when you need to practice it, they, somebody needs to be there to make sure that you're learning it properly and that you're not going to cause an outage or hurt yourself. So that's where the spatial technology comes in. So we we pose that essentially if you have say 3D simulations and VR simulations, you can have a practice in a safe environment where you're not gonna you're not gonna throw down any services and you're not going to um, you're not going to hurt yourself. Um, so there's so there's like an overhead cost associated with building these things, but then when you have enough time uh, and enough like sessions launched, you kind of you kind of make the money back through cost avoidance. Um, so a little bit about spatial learning technologies, we investigated three aspects. So it was like classic video games like desktop 3D, um, virtual reality, which everybody knows well, and then augmented reality, which is much more of an emer like a much more emerging technology. And we looked at them in this kind of way. Essentially, it was down to the level of effort and the output you could get. So um, augmented reality was still very much considered to be in an early phase. So there was R&D required, required, there was limited software options, there was just a heavy lift to get it in the field, so extreme effort. With virtual reality, it was becoming more mature. So there was like a lot more options for how you build. There was like more affordable, more stable tech involved. So we considered it to be on the cusp and we decided to investigate it. And then with desktop 3D, essentially, um, there is some value you can get from the simulations, but it's just, it doesn't quite, quite hit the immersive level or the kind of like context of having the motion controllers in that environment. So we decided to prioritize VR to begin with. And then here's the time savings that we can put alongside it, for instance. Like if like this is a basic example of somebody throws up a door alarm, like security is paramount in an Amazon data center. So it's very easy to trigger an alarm in one of four ways. So whenever somebody triggers an alarm, somebody manually has to arrange training with that person, bring them into a classroom, you know, teach them the error of their ways, and then eventually sign off. But it's a laborious pro pro process. It requires involvement with the manager and the security manager. Um, so we pose a new, a new option where the system assigns the training. They go and they take a VR simulated version of a badging event, and they learn all the ways that they can trigger a, trigger an alarm. And then the system tracks completion. And in total, 
then we could we could infer from that that every single completion in this process would save the business about two hours 40 minutes of of, uh, of trainer time so the security manager gets to focus on risk assessment the manager gets to gets to keep doing what he's doing and then the the offender um, goes through their training and then just gets back back to shift ready and check our time okay so um, building this, it's like, do you use Unity or do you use Unreal? That initial one that I showed earlier, that was built in, in Unity. We built it with a vendor team and we had some third-party solution involvement, but the vendor teams and the, and the third-party third -party expenses were particularly high. And then we ended up investigating Unreal. Um, so yeah, here's a breakdown pretty much of the flow that would be required for the Unity imp like implementation. Um, we couldn't really at the time and the people we were talking to, we couldn't really find a way to just use Unity entirely on its own, which kind of proliferates the complications involved in, in, in standing up a solution like this. Whereas when we were playing around with Unreal, somebody else, some, some enterprising guy in the fulfillment centers was playing around with Unreal for like a VR headset. And uh, he was waxing lyrical about it and he brought it to us. And he had a lot of good points. So I started playing around with prototypes for this one and it really simplified the solution for us. So we decided to attempt that going forward uh, the simplify part of invent and simplify remove a bunch of licensing costs and external team reliance and move on to developing vr ourselves so here is kind of the start of it um just me and a desk and an oculus quest 2 um, we couldn't really use an Oculus Quest 2 um, because there was a lot of stuff going on with Facebook at the time. They were removing the hardware switches and making it more of a software switch for the uh, enterprise version. So Amazon wouldn't really be allowing something that Facebook could flip the switch on into their data centers. But for early development of the trainings, it's like there's just so much at hand to like develop using the Oculus Quest toolkit. So um, we started developing in that and we found an alternative later down the road and we kind of converted over. So here's like the first proof of concept that I, that I created to kind of show how Unreal Engine is simple to develop in and it can get us what we need. This was developed in about an hour after I got everything up and running, just have the headset on your head and do a couple of nodes, which kind of activates and deactivates the physics for a door with all base components in the Unreal Engine toolkit. Um, and then eventually as the program grew legs and we started uplifting this into a proper training course, it got to be quite a bit more complicated. So this is what uh, my developer fondly referred to as Getty Junction. Um, we essentially built on top of and built on top of the door. Um, we replaced the meshes of the doors, made it look like it was, you know, a, like made it look like as it does in a real data center. And we just kept using the door essentially as the governing script for everything. Um, for future versions of this, we kind of got a lot more optimized in how we have a central script that governs what all the other things do, tells all the actors what to do, triggers the different um, triggers the different variables. But yeah, for the first one, the door was the first thing there, so it it ended up being the uh, actor with the blueprint that grew legs. Uh, moving on, we got a lot cleaner with our code, got a, got a lot more refined. We are here's uh, my developer exp experimenting with. Um, hand animations to reach parity with the previous version, with the, peer, with the previous uh, virtual reality training solution. Um, yeah, so once we had a replacement for the VR pipeline, we were thinking, what's next? The issue with VR largely is um, the logistical challenges. You've got to get a VR like space set up in multiple different multiple different sites you have to have a rock solid process and solution for people putting this on learning the tech and getting through there's kind of a barrier to entry there which um makes it quite difficult to just ambiently launch something of this nature so the next stage then is to focus on desktop 3d so we're currently working on this is like the dev pipeline that was followed for the vr but now we're adding a second stream to it which is browser streaming so the trick to this is you do the desktop build you create the models you create the environments and you create that flat pane of glass interaction, which Unreal Engine has been doing for 
I don't know how long now, but since its inception. And then we finish the desktop delivery, we deliver it, and then the uplift to VR is a much shorter lift. And then we have a dual modality pipeline. So like this is the, the development and all the different teams that kind of contribute to the process. And then this is how it sits in our um, environment. So essentially, we uplift it to the browser streaming platform or the v VR headset delivery, like mobile device management system. It presents it to the learner and we gather data on completions, times, error rates, and it all kind of filters into our learning platform. And then the Amazon S3 piece is essentially bits and pieces that we can pull into the solution that doesn't require us to republish the package. We can update text, audio, video, um, and it loads in on runtime. Um, yeah, so uh, the thing that we're working on right now is the flagship piece for uh, desktop is a virtual data center tour, which is going to be public facing. So it kind of gives people an idea of like what Amazon does, some of the key initiatives that they that they want to discuss regarding like efforts to contribute green energy to the grid. Um, there's a logist reverse logistics warehouses because with all of that hardware that's falling off the far end of that conveyor, they want to reuse as much as possible. And then a lot about the power and network journey and how like power goes into an Amazon site, how it reaches the servers, how the data is processed, and ways that they're trying to find to optimize the power usage efficiency, which is the aim of the game for most Amazon departments, is like for every watt of power, how do you get the most compute out of it? And uh, with that, yes. So one example of this is there's the AWS Cloud Quest. So when somebody's trying to learn about AWS, like compute services, they've got this sprawling city where you can learn all these different aspects about like different aspects of developer life. Um, and you can f figure out the concepts in kind of a playful way. Um, this would be kind of the infrastructure partner to it, which kind of gives people an idea of what the data centers are about, how they're supplied. And then essentially, if you're going for a job in it, or if you wanted to be a customer, how your hardware is maintained and secured. And then that's it. Thanks, Andrew. Amazing. And it's amazing what you're doing there. Um, just question-wise, um, jobs in this immersive technology in the future do you think ireland has enough people do we have the skills what skills do they need do you need people yeah i do well like i think everybody does there's like a big um like there's a big reliance on kind of people that are just kind of figuring it out there's um there's a guy that was fantastic i found him on youtube and then i ended up just like like paying him for training sessions, Jonathan Bardwell. He's great. But we kind of rely a lot on people that are kind of feeling it out. Like, mm -hmm. um, like Elaine was saying before, like, there's a lot of people just figuring it out. There's not there's there's not a huge amount of formally trained people for the for the needs here. Um, like my like myself, even though I'm in a big company, it's like I ended up having to figure a lot figure out a lot of this myself, just just me in a desk. Yourself, so yeah. Yeah, so now that it's like, I really feel like there's a lot of work in this sphere. I think it's a fascinating field, and I think that there's a big appetite that's ever growing for it. So, um, yeah, but there's not enough. There's not enough really like like opportunities to figure out what all this is about. There's a lot of people feeling around in the dark. So, um, it would be great. Um, the work that you're doing in IADT, teaching people kind of how to use the immersive tech, is fantastic. Yeah, it sounds like an endorsement that there's a there's a need there for courses in this stuff and in um, uh, developers and learning inst instructional designers and all of that. Um, can we try that cloud quest? Do you have a, a link to it? Are you sure you could throw in the chat with you when you get a chance? Sure. Yeah, I'll go find it for you. Um, yeah, CloudQuest uh -huh. is uh, something that's yeah just publicly available for people that want to figure out uh, what AWS is all about service-wise. And I, I've just got a, a question here. Rory Mullins is asking, what aspects of learning are not working via these technologies? Yeah, I mean, um, when it comes to choosing what to focus your time on when with VR, it's like you got to figure out a very like specific use case for it. Like um, we played around with it a little bit where we're like, 
we're using the laptop to play around and to interact with the ticket while you're doing your work. And the context is only relevant insofar as it relates to the different tasks you do. But you generally want to avoid, say, software training in VR because there's just better uses for that. Like the perfect mm -hmm. way to simulate a software training is with a with a flat piece of software on a computer. Um, also, there's like aspects that are particularly spatial so like the door opening piece i mean realistically you could train that as a procedural training but mm -hmm. when it comes to like replacing a ram stick or a cpu the orientation of it is, is crucial because like you can break something very easily if you have it orientated wrong yeah. so you got to find like um key areas of like pain points and key learning shortcuts shortfalls and then identify the best solution for it because like vr isn't a one-size-fits-all solution for training